There's a pair of suttas in which the Buddha talks about the most helpful external factor, the practice, and the most helpful internal factor. The internal factor is appropriate attention. In Pali, this is called yoni soma nasikara. means focusing on the right things, focusing on the right issues, asking yourself the right questions, and particularly seeing things in terms of the Four Noble Truths. And that's pretty radical. We hear the term Four Noble Truths so often that we don't stop to think about what a radical teaching they are. Their guideline for how you look at your experience. And most of us, we look at experience in terms of what's us and what's not us. What we are, what things we have under our control, what things we don't have under our control. What things we like, what things we don't like. And then we start building things up from there. But the Buddha says to put those issues aside and look at the issue simply, where is there stress in your life right now? And what's causing it? And what can you do to put an end to that cause? That's it. Those are the basic outlines of how you look at things from the outside on in. Essentially, it's a problem-solving approach. Years back when I was teaching English composition in Chiang Mai, I had a lot of social science majors, and I figured it would be good for them to learn how to analyze a problem and propose a solution based on the cause. So we started out with, I had them write advertisements and for the guys. Women don't find you attractive? Why is that? Well, maybe because you don't look old enough or mature enough. So you'd look more mature if you smoked cigarettes, that kind of thing. And then once they got the basic principle down, that when you, you attack a problem, you don't attack the problem, you attack the cause. Then we worked up from there until we got to social issues. Well, the same principle applies inside. You have to look for the cause of the suffering and pare it down to the real essentials. Because if you get too, much, too distracted with other issues, they get in the way. So we're here to look at, as the Buddha said, the craving in our minds, the craving and the ignorance. Those are the main causes. And we try to develop the qualities of mind that can develop a sense of dispassion for the craving, that can cut through the ignorance with knowledge. And all this is a question of internal skill. How you deal with sights and sounds and smells and tastes and tactile sensations. How you deal with thoughts and feelings, perceptions. Even how you deal with the act of consciousness. All these things are a matter of skill. This is why the Buddha didn't present himself as a savior. He was a teacher. He pointed out the way. And part of his pointing out the way was basically through his own actions, his own way of dealing with people. You could see him in action. So this is how a skillful person acts. This is how a skillful person speaks. This is how a skillful person presents his ideas or her ideas. And this is where the question of the next factor that's helpful for awakening, which is the external factor. The most 
helpful external factors having admirable friendship, i.e. friendship with admirable people, people who have developed this skill. And they can teach it to you. They can't make you skillful, but they can show you how to be skillful. That's a special quality of friendship. Because on the one hand, it deals with very intimate issues in your mind, how you're dealing with issues from the past, how you're dealing with issues here in the present moment. And the issues are very internal. But at the same time, the solution is also internal. In other words, no teacher can come and straighten out your mind for you. You've got to do that for yourself, which means the teacher has to give you space. This is the quality of admirable friendship. There's a lot of space in that friendship. Although on the one hand, we'll, we're dealing with internal things, how your mind and your heart interact with the events come in the course of any day. But there's also space for you to work on these things. In other words, it's the kind of friendship that encourages appropriate attention, because ultimately it's that internal factor is the most important one. The external factor is there to help, to show that it is possible and that this looking at your experience in this way really does lead to results, it helps open your imagination. It's like seeing someone walk on a, on a tightrope. If you had never seen anybody walk on a tightrope, you might never even think that it would be possible. But suppose as a child you go to the circus and you see someone walking on a tightrope, and that inspires you. Maybe you'd like to walk on a tightrope as well. Simply seeing another person be skillful indicates to you that it is possible. In the same way with the Buddha, we read about his life. We read about the life of his noble disciples all the way down to the present. That it is possible to put an end to suffering. For most of us, that possibility. If we hadn't heard of it, this wouldn't occur to us. We might think in a moment or two that we'd like to have that, but then there's so much around us that would try to convince us that it's not possible, in the same way the time of the Buddha. As a young prince, he wanted to find a, a deathless happiness, and all of his friends, his family said, oh, it's not possible, we can't do it. Look at all the great sages of the past. Even they had to make do with what our ordinary pleasures are. And if those are all the examples you have, most people would just say, okay, I guess that's the way it is, and they just give up. Fortunately for us, the Buddha didn't give up. Even if it's not possible, I'd rather die in the effort of trying to find if it is. He had that kind of dedication, which is why he's the ultimate admirable friend. But he not only came back and said, hey, I did it, he came back and said, this is how it's done. And he put in all the time and effort and energy. If you want to get a sense of how patient the Buddha could be, read through the Vinaya. All the monks and nuns were misbehaving. And he very patiently had to set out rules, okay, to stop this, stop that. He went through all that so this would keep the religion going, keep his teaching alive. One of the stories is how the, there was one year when the monks were invited to spend the rains in a certain place, and the person who invited them there forgot all about them. And it turned out there was a famine. There was hardly any rice around. The monks ended up eating the barley that was usually used to feed horses. Saribhuta got concerned. Maybe this is going to be the end of the teaching. 
So he talked to the Buddha about this. I mean, what, what is it that puts an end to the teaching? What is it that guarantees that the teaching will last a long time? And the Buddha said it's by setting out a body mukha, setting out a set of rules for the behavior of the monastic sangha. That's what keeps it alive for a long time. So sorry, Buddha said, well, set out a set of rules then, please. The Buddha said the time hasn't come for that yet. It's when people start misbehaving. That's when you have to set out rules. And sure enough, people start misbehaving. And so we very patiently set out those rules so that now we have the teaching alive. That's the container that's kept everything together. And the Buddhism is just like a thread. In the old days when they would make flower arrangements, they would stitch the flowers together with thread to make sure they stayed in place, to keep them from scattering. So the Buddha went through all that to give us sets of standards, not only teaching us the Dharma, but also giving us the patterns and the protocols to show how a group of people living together, practicing the Dharma, how do they live together. So continue the principle of admirable friendship. I was giving each person space. So we have the solitude and the, the quietness that can be conducive to the mind, and at the same time giving encouragement. In other words, even though we live together, we try not to get in each other's way, and we have with the fact that there are quite a number of people here together is actually an encouragement in the practice. That's what our basic relationship should be. But ultimately, it all points to that issue of admirable friendship leading to appropriate attention. Because appropriate attention goes deep down inside. It goes past in those parts of the mind where no outside relationship can touch. Because no matter how intimate we are, and anyone who's lived with one other person for a long period of time will realize this. There's still large areas of that other person you don't know and you can't control. You see this especially when the other person is sick, when the other person is dying. There comes a point where you can't reach them. But that's where the Four Noble Truths can still reach them, as long as they've worked on them and developed them as a skill in the mind for dealing with whatever issue of suffering or stress comes up. So this is why we give pride a place to appropriate attention, and then try to develop a friendship that creates the proper container for that. So that in living here together, our, our activities are actually a help for one another, and not an obstacle to awakening. So I always try to keep this point in mind as you go through the day. The more that you apply appropriate attention to your own experience, the more you become an admirable friend. <laughs>